All right, well, let's get started. Hello, I'm Debbie Drell, Director of Membership at the National Organization for Rare Disorders, also known as NORD. I am not only the Director of Membership, but I'm a caregiver for my sister, Alex, who has been living with a rare life-threatening heart and lung disease called pulmonary hypertension. She's had it for 22 years now. The agenda you see on the screen is the format for this 60-minute listening session. What is a listening session? If you have never heard of this, listening sessions are one to two hour meetings via Zoom or phone. And before the pandemic, when it was safe, they used to take place in person. And these meetings are between FDA staff with patients, caregivers, and their advocates. They're typically not open to the public and they are non-advisory discussions. This listening session today is very special and it's rare because we opened it to the public. Listening sessions are meant to facilitate expeditious sharing of patient and advocate perspectives on how their disease and treatments affect their life. We have collected questions in advance through the registration form for this Zoom meeting, and we will answer them throughout the meeting. As you can tell, there's no Q&A function, but we will let you know at the end how you can submit questions to NORD and FDA. On the next slide, you'll see our mission. Founded in 1983, NORD is an umbrella organization, a federation of nearly 330 rare disease, patient-led nonprofit organizations. We're not just a federation of these nonprofits, we represent and support the more than 30 million Americans who are living with rare diseases. You'll see our mission on the screen. Uh, NORD, an independent nonprofit, is leading the fight to improve the lives of rare disease patients and families. And we do this by supporting patients and organizations, accelerating research, providing education, disseminating information, and driving public policy. I want to thank FDA for continuing to seek the patient voice in all that they do. This listening session, this listening session is a testament to the commitment of FDA to the idea that rare disease patients deserve to be partners and to be heard throughout the work that the FDA does in drug development and regulatory process. Two years ago, FDA created the Rare Disease Patient Listening Sessions in partnership with NORD. We have had the honor to collaborate closely with FDA's patient affairs staff on these listening sessions, which, like I mentioned before, offer patients and caregivers an opportunity to speak directly with FDA staff about what it's like to live in their shoes with a specific rare disease. Time and again, patients and their families tell us how much it's meant to them that FDA is willing to listen. NORD's relationship to FDA is strong, and our work on more than 12 rare disease-specific listening sessions leads us to where we are today, hosting this large-scale public-facing meeting on the worst public health crisis of our lifetime and how this pandemic directly and profoundly impacts the rare disease community in America. NORD took the time to survey the community and we asked them about how COVID-19 impacted their lives. Um, in March of this year, NORD began hearing questions and concerns from members of the rare disease community about the impact of COVID-19. To better understand your concerns, your experience, and to help address your questions, we designed and launched this survey just for the rare disease community. The survey was conducted twice, once in April, the very beginning, and then again in June. A total of 1,600 respondents participated in the surveys, providing us with rich quantitative and qualitative data. We published our findings from the first survey in May, and then the findings from the second survey we published in August. And we did a webinar uh, to talk about the findings. The statistics on the screen in the infographic are really just a snapshot on the impact of COVID-19. If there's time at the end of the meeting, I can go through more details on the impact of COVID-19 on the community based on what we learned from the survey. Um, I can also, if there's time, talk about how NORD can help you today navigate the challenges of living in the pandemic. I mentioned this survey because this listening session is all about COVID-19 impact. And so there might be uh, questions you have that are not specific to what is addressed. There might be information that you want or that could benefit you that's not related here. And uh, NORD has uh, information and support for you. But next, let's talk about what to expect in this listening session. So the survey showed us the depth and breadth of the pandemic's impact on our community. And if you are a patient or a caregiver living in the pandemic, I mean, if you're just living in the pandemic, you are already impacted. But if you have a rare disease, uh, there is an extra level of uh, impact. So when we announced this listening session, it was no surprise to us that we received incredible response. Uh, 630 people registered to attend, 
116 people had expressed an interest in sharing their personal experience at this meeting, and we received nearly 100 questions submitted to FDA through that registration form that you used to get into this webinar. So 116 people expressed an interest, uh, and COVID is really, the way that it's impact our community is very comprehensive. So how do we focus? Um, and due to time constraints, we identified in those questions, three major topic areas around the coronavirus, and those topic areas specifically intersect with key divisions within the FDA. And so those areas are drug shortages, personal protective equipment shortages, and access to clinical trials during the pandemic. To be honest, we received so many heartfelt stories, and it was a painstaking process to identify three rare disease family stories of all of the stories that were shared. But we identified three stories, one for each of these areas. In addition, all the questions that were submitted in the registration, we gathered them all and submitted them in advance of this listening session to the FDA for their consideration. What you will hear today are three personal stories of how COVID-19 had devastating and life-changing impact on their families. And their stories really capture what we think is happening across the country. Uh, these stories will have um, FDA response interwoven. So it, you'll hear a story and then at specific FDA staff who work in this area of one of these topics, they will come in and answer questions relating to that topic and directly responding to the stories. So that is the format and that's what you can expect. So now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Janet Maynard, the Director of Office of Orphan Products Development at FDA. She will provide the official welcome from FDA. I just provided the welcome from NORD. Um, she'll provide the official welcome from FDA and discuss the crucial role FDA play in ensuring new medications for rare diseases, that they're safe, effective, and useful to patients. Dr. Maynard, thank you so much for joining us. If you could unmute and get on video. Sure. Thanks, Debbie. Can you see me? Yes, there you go. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for being here today. We are experiencing an extraordinary time for our nation and the world. The COVID-19 public health emergency is of exceptional magnitude and requires all of us joining together to find solutions. We greatly appreciate you being here today and contributing your voices and perspectives to this listening session. Today, we will discuss the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on people living with rare diseases and their families. In addition, we will discuss FDA's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic has broad impacts from accessing medical care to conducting and participating in clinical trials. Patients with rare diseases may be especially vulnerable to the impacts of COVID-19. It is essential that we support the development of safe and effective treatments and vaccines for COVID-19 during this public health emergency and continue to support FDA's other public health priorities. These priorities include supporting the development of safe and effective treatments for patients with rare diseases. My name is Janet Maynard and I am the Director of the Office of Orphan Products Development at FDA. It is an honor to be here today. We recognize that it is a very difficult time for people with rare diseases and their families and greatly appreciate this opportunity to hear from you. Today, we will hear directly from the rare disease community and FDA will respond to questions submitted to NORD. To help respond to these questions, we are joined today by a number of FDA experts, Dr. Katie Donahue from the Division of Rare Diseases and Medical Genetics and the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, or CEDAR, Dr. Kerr Elzerod from the Office of Medical Policy in CEDAR, and Dr. Afton Roz from All Hazards Readiness Response and Cybersecurity from the Center for Devices and Radiological Health, or CDRH. And please know that we work closely with the patient affairs staff and also consulted with experts in our Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, or CBER, and our drug shortages staff as we were preparing for this webinar. This webinar is just one example of how the three medical product centers and the Office of the Commissioner work together to support rare disease product development. Before we turn to these experts and input from members of the rare disease community, we will touch on three topic areas. First, we will consider FDA's role in supporting medical product development. 
Second, we will recognize the profound impact of COVID-19. And third, we will discuss the importance of working together during this challenging time. As background, FDA's mission is to promote and protect the public health by helping safe and effective treatments reach the market in a timely way and monitoring treatments for safe, continued safety after they are in use. The FDA is a science-based regulatory agency that is organized by product area. The scope of FDA's regulatory authority is very broad. FDA's responsibilities are closely related to those of several other government agencies. In general, FDA regulates foods, including infant formulas and dietary supplements, drugs, including prescription, both brand name and generic, and non-prescription or over-the-counter drugs biologics, including vaccines and blood products, medical devices from things like tongue depressors to complex technologies such as heart pacemakers, electronic products that give off radiation, such as laser products, cosmetics, including color additives found in makeup and nail polish, veterinary products, including pet foods and veterinary drugs and devices, and tobacco products, including cigarettes and smokeless tobacco. FDA has many responsibilities. One of FDA's responsibilities that is central to our discussion today is to ensure that drugs and vaccines and other biological products and medical devices intended for human use are safe and effective. In addition, FDA advances public health by helping to speed medical product innovations. During this current public health emergency, we continue to maintain focus on our goal of supporting the development of safe and effective therapies for patients and families. This includes important efforts to support the development and availability of accurate and reliable COVID-19 tests and supporting the development of treatments and vaccines for COVID-19. In addition to assisting clinical trials for COVID-19 treatments and vaccines, we are assisting drug companies that are conducting clinical trials during the COVID-19 pandemic. Specifically, we are helping to ensure that any logistical and operational challenges resulting from COVID-19 are addressed so that clinical trials can continue. Another very important area FDA has focused on is working to ensure continued access to necessary medical products, including drugs, biological products, and medical devices. The rare disease community, including people with rare diseases and their families, have been profoundly impacted by COVID-19. A recent study by Nord revealed that 95% of people with rare diseases have been impacted to some degree by COVID-19 at a cost to their immediate and long-term health and well-being. COVID-19 has been associated with interruptions in care through cancellation of medical appointments, disruptions in clinical trials, as well as job loss related to this, and also loss of health insurance. People with certain underlying conditions are at risk <clears throat> of more severe illness from COVID-19. We appreciate this opportunity to hear directly from patients and caregivers regarding the impact of COVID-19. As we continue to respond to COVID-19, our efforts related to sponsors' development of drugs and biological products to treat, to treat rare diseases remains a priority for the FDA. The COVID-19 pandemic may impact clinical trials of products. Potential challenges include site closures and travel limitations. We have been working to mitigate these potential impacts. Specifically, we are working closely with medical product companies who are conducting and planning clinical trials. In addition, we have issued guidance to provide greater, greater clarity to medical product companies about how to proceed with these trials and deal with necessary deviations in trial conduct created by the pandemic. Developing a treatment for a rare disease can present unique challenges such as the small number of people affected and the different manifestations of a given disease. We are committed to working together to overcome these challenges. While there are challenges, there are also opportunities in rare disease product development. With recent scientific advances, there are new opportunities for the development of therapies for rare disease. While the pandemic presents challenges, we are working together on strategies and solutions to address these challenges. Further, we are looking to learn from and apply more broadly some of the approaches we've taken during the pandemic, which may prove beneficial in supporting product development. We greatly appreciate this opportunity to engage with the rare disease community, and we look forward to continued advancement of treatments for rare diseases. Thank you so much. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Maynard, for that welcome and helping our audience get to know FDA, particularly in this current climate of the pandemic. It really sets the foundation and tone for the rest of this listening session. So now we're gonna get started with our first rare disease family story on how the impact of pandemic affected their lives. I'd like to introduce Christy We Met. Christy, can you please unmute your line and come on to video? Yes, thank you. Awesome. I'd like to turn it over to you to tell us um, what happened to your family during the pandemic. Thank you so much. My name is Christy Wiemet, and I have three children, two of which were born with a rare genetic condition called primary hypoxaluria type 1. My 17-year-old daughter, Molly, started getting kidney stones when she was three years old, and she didn't get the diagnosis until she was six. She had passed many kidney stones and needed surgery to remove the larger stones throughout her life. She is currently in kidney failure and on hemodialysis and also on the transplant rating list for a liver and kidney. My nine-year-old son, Matthew, went into end-stage renal failure when he was five months old. After two years of hemodialysis six days a week and peritoneal dialysis seven days a week, he received a liver and kidney transplant when he was two and a half years old. He had several challenges and a difficult recovery, but he is seven years post-transplant. He still faces transplant-related health issues and has on several recent hospital stays to treat those complications. He's on dozens of medications to prevent rejection and to deal with the health issues related to his disease and the transplant. He has a G-tube to assist in some of the medication and to help get his three liters of fluid a day goal. We were facing several challenges before this pandemic hit, but once COVID restrictions hit nationwide, it really made things more difficult and significantly altered our lives. Molly had been declining in health, but was participating in a clinical trial across the country, which required us to, to travel by plane every couple of weeks. The medication being studied had data that was very promising for this condition. She was unable to continue with the trial when the flights were canceled and prevented us from traveling to the study site. Her health continued to decline to where she had no other option but to begin hemodialysis six days a week and to be placed on the transplant waiting list. Making sure that our children are being cared for is very challenging. Matthew needs to have his medication and fluids given throughout the day and on a strict schedule so that the medication does not counteract with each other. His immune system is significantly compromised and we have to be careful with who is around him. He is currently suffering from side effects from his most recent procedure and he's not responding well to that treatment. We are not sure if he will need to be readmitted to the hospital or if we will be able to continue his treatment at home. In-person appointments were changed to video appointments for Matthew and they wanted to limit his exposure to hospital settings so labs were clustered to fewer visits. He looked good, but what couldn't be seen on the video appointments was his blood pressure was dangerously high. When we finally got him to an in-person appointment, they realized his blood pressure issues and he was kept in the hospital for over a week until it could be brought under control. We could not be discharged from the hospital until medication prescriptions could be filled. However, the pharmacies the hospital used had to change their hours or close due to COVID. Some of the medication is considered a special order and not kept at other pharmacies. We could not find the medication within 150 miles of us. When I asked the hospital that prescribed the medication why they did not have it available, I was told there were restrictions with deliveries of medication due to COVID. We had to stay in the hospital extra days until we were able to find the medication at an out of network facility, which we had to pay out of pocket for. When our son had to come back to the hospital for another treatment and stay, we had to bring that hard to find medication to the hospital because they still did not have it in stock. Other medications we needed were limited to how much we can get filled each time. COVID-19 has completely changed our lives. My teenage daughter had hope with her out-of-state clinical trial, but because of the infection risk from air travel, she had to leave the trial and is now in kidney failure on hemodialysis and waiting a transplant for liver and kidney. My son, with my son having frequent admissions in the hospital and my daughter at dialysis appointments, my husband had to leave his job to be able to help me care for our children which has our financial situation more strained. When my son has to go to the hospital, they have drug shortages and supply challenges. So we never know if we have to bring our own medication, which is already difficult to find and sometimes more expensive because it may be only found at out of network facilities. 
when he goes to the hospital, they won't discharge him unless he has those medications. So we have to spend more time in the hospital, which increases his exposure, exposure risk. He's very immunocompromised. I have always tried to be prepared with medication and supplies to, be, to care for my children with a rare disease. Since COVID-19, it has been difficult to find quality supplies that are not overpriced. I never thought that I would be the mom to stockpile medication, but this situation feels dire and I worry about having enough of my son's medication since I can't trust the hospitals or pharmacies to have them. As a rare disease mom and caregiver, I am used to the unknown and unpredictable. However, 2020 threw us for a loop when COVID hit. I don't think any of us were prepared for this. Thank you for letting me share my family story. Christy, thank you so much for sharing your family stories for these beautiful photos of Molly and Matthew. Um, I can only imagine what it's like to have to work so hard for your children's care and livelihood during such a challenging time, and it doesn't seem like there's an end in sight. Your story is an important experience to share because we don't know how long this pandemic will last. And unfortunately, we have heard similar stories from the rare disease community around the country. We're so grateful that you share your experience so honestly about the reality that rare kids face and adults face with drug shortages during the pandemic. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Kerr Alzarad and Dr. Kathleen Donahue from the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. We're so glad that we could bring them here to tell us um, their thoughts on this subject, as well as answer very specific questions. We did collect 100 questions from the community and with the We Met's family's story in mind, the first question we have for FDA goes to Dr. Donahue, and it is this. What are the recommended plans for facilitating access to medication for rare diseases during this global pandemic? Thank you for your story, and um, thanks to Nord for having us here today. I'm glad that we have a chance to talk about it. Um, you know, given the COVID-19 pandemic, certain drugs are, are in shortage. Uh, we're seeing disruptions across supply chains, and FDA is working proactively with manufacturers, and especially those for rare disease therapies, to evaluate the supply chain, to include um, active pharmaceutical ingredients, finished dose forms, and other components that may be impacted with supply chain disruptions from the outbreak. Um, so for example, we've reached out to all of the manufacturers for immune globulin, um, in order to assess availability and make sure that there's continued supply of this critical product for patients with primary immunodeficiency disorders. Um, and so we work closely with manufacturers like this to try and prevent or at least reduce the impact uh, of shortages. Thank you for that response, Dr. Donahue. That's incredibly helpful to know that FDA works proactively and periodically to assess issues around drug shortages. I guess the follow-up question to that is, um, and this one will go to Dr. Elzerod, Kara Elzerod, um, and that's what we can do if a medication we take is in short supply or back order. Is there any way to prepare for that ahead of time? So what can we do if a medication we take is in short supply or back order? And uh, I think a lot of patients are thinking about this. Thank you so much, Debbie, and thank you, uh, Nord, for this opportunity. And I also want to thank Christy for the story, uh, of her story, and uh, along with Molly and Matthew. Um, I really appreciate this opportunity to be able to answer a little bit of this. Of course, you know, uh, our healthcare providers are the front, at the front line of all of this. And if a medication is in shortage or anticipated to go in shortage, consultation with a healthcare provider is really important. And it's not uncommon, for example, to providers uh, to, to identify alternative ways to provide the same medications, for example, different dosage form or to find alternatives altogether. Um, we also ask to please continue to check FDA CEDAR uh, drug shortages webpage uh, and the page for CEPR, Center for Biologics Regulated Products as well. This will help get the latest information on current shortages as well as anticipate, anticipated duration for such shortages and along with multiple other information. Uh, FDA keeps those websites updated regularly and uh, the most recent information are typically on them and they come from directly from the manufacturer and we continue to make sure those websites are updated. And if you have any questions regarding the drug shortages in general, please contact CEDAR drug shortage uh, staff. I believe you have a slide with those email addresses. Uh, the, the Center for Drugs uh, uh, email address is drug shortages, one word, at fda.hhs.gov. And also for uh, biologic products, uh, you can email us at CEPR shortages, one word, at fda.hhs.gov. 
Thank you. That's very useful information. Let's skip to the next slide then and um, show what Dr. Carol Zarad mentioned, these resources. Thank you so much for being here, for answering that question and letting us know how we can follow up um, talking to our doctor about the therapy we're on and um, what our needs are in the future and today. So we'll keep this slide up for a couple of seconds. If you want to take a screenshot, if you want to grab your camera and take a quick snap, also know that the recording will be made available um, online and we will be sharing that with you as soon as it's ready. So you can always access this slide and the whole talk later. So next we'll be hearing from another community voice, Laura Bonnell, who will share her family's experience with PPE shortages during the pandemic. Laura, can you please unmute your line and come on to camera? Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Laura Bonnell and I live in a Detroit suburb in Michigan and my two daughters, 25-year-old Molly and 23-year-old Emily, live with cystic fibrosis, which is a rare disease, a genetic disease, that produces a thick, sticky mucus. It causes chronic and fatal lung infection and interferes with digestion. Cystic fibrosis affects multiple organ systems in the body. Since my daughter's diagnosis all those years ago, we have continuously used personal protective equipment. We didn't think twice about it until the pandemic hit. When the pandemic did hit the United States, I knew that it was just a matter of time before it landed in Michigan. I was concerned about discrimination against people with CF and for everyone with underlying conditions. We have always needed PPE, but now there would be a much greater demand for it. But for my daughters, it's always been life and death. As a mom of two girls with CF, I always had PPE in the home, but I wasn't stocked up on those supplies. Unfortunately, we didn't have any N95 masks and we only had about 20 disposable masks. A lot of other CF moms were in the same situation and the mom guilt began. We thought we were terrible moms. We had not stocked up on those N95 masks. CF doctors were telling us that there were none available. You couldn't get any during the pandemic. We were running out of a variety of PPE, including masks. This is critical for my daughter because she lives with her boyfriend who is following the COVID rules, but still visits his family. He takes appropriate precautions, masking and hand washing, but he has to return to work and protocols are being taken, but he needs the daily new mask to keep my daughter safe. My 25 year old daughter, Emily was getting anxious and stressed. She lives, like I said, in her own apartment, 10 minutes from us and I couldn't find any PPP online for her. There was just none in the stores and we, were, we weren't going into the stores anyway. People in my CF chat groups couldn't find any PPE either. I was mad, frustrated, and in a bit of a panic. The girls CF doctors told us that during the pandemic, one parent should always be the parent connected to the outside world. So if we didn't have to go into the store, if we did have to go into the store, it should be the same person and that person shouldn't go near our daughter. So my husband, Joe, was forced to go into Costco by necessity. I have a foundation that helps people with cystic fibrosis, the Bonnell Foundation Living with Cystic Fibrosis. I called my county commissioner, Dave Woodward, and said, Dave, how can all these Metro Detroit businesses have so much PPE and I can't find masks or anything? And he said that the county bought everything that their suppliers had in stock as soon as COVID-19 hit Michigan. His warehouse is full of supplies. What did I need? I told him that I needed a lot. He brought over a truckload of a variety of supplies and masks. I posted all over social media to my CF people that I had it and they could come pick it up or I would drive it to them. I drove some two hours to meet one family's needs. And so many people were coming to pick it up from my house that I had to make a schedule. It was all gone in a week. People from hours away were requesting it. I documented everything with photos and video. I had emails and calls from people in other states who had CF that were requesting that I ship them PPE. But sadly, I couldn't do it for fear of going into the post office because of COVID-19. There are many advantages to being an advocate and having strong connections to the CF community. 
What about all those parents who are isolated and do not have the training, time, energy, resources, or knowledge on how to fight for their children's PPE needs? And even with my privilege and position to advocate for my girls, I still cannot get the much needed N95 masks. My girls do need to protect themselves and not rely on others to possibly protect them by wearing a mask and wearing it correctly. Each girl has one N95 and they're saving it in case things get worse than they are now. I'm honored to share my family's story and my concerns for the larger CF community. Thanks for hearing me. Thank you. Laura, thank you so much for sharing your family's experience. That's unbelievable. It's, it's just incredible to think about how far you had to go and how much need there were for all of these families. Um, and even with your connections and your leadership with the Bonnell Foundation, it, even then it was still really difficult to get this life-preserving PPE. So with your story in mind, I'd like to welcome Dr. Ross Afton from the Center for Devices and Radiological Health, the CDRH at FDA. We're so glad that she could join us today. And she also was a part of the group that reviewed the 100 questions that came in from the community um, and looked specifically at PPE questions. I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Ross for a response from FDA about PPE shortages and even just some basics for those who are unfamiliar about the complex aspects of using PPE. Dr. Ross, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. First, we would like to thank Laura for sharing this perspective with us. We certainly recognize the concern expressed by patients living with chronic pulmonary conditions. Because there are a variety of ways that patients can protect themselves and each patient is unique, we would recommend that they discuss their concerns with their healthcare provider and work together to determine reasonable options to protect themselves, including the appropriate use of PPE for them or their family members. Some options that can be worn to help slow the spread include respirators and face coverings. Per CDC, items for consideration as patients engage in discussions with their healthcare provider about respirators or face coverings include fit and comfort. Fit is important because if the respirator or face covering doesn't fit well, it doesn't provide maximum protection to the wearer. Comfort is important because you may have to wear the respirator or face covering for long periods of time. You want to be able to breathe easily and you don't want to have to touch the respirator or face covering to adjust it. FDA has and continues to undertake a number of efforts to help assure that healthcare providers have PPE available. The Emergency Use Authorization Authority allows FDA to help strengthen the nation's protections against public health threats by facilitating the availability and use of medical countermeasures needed during emergencies. To address concerns about the lack of availability of PPE for healthcare personnel, FDA has issued EUAs for many types of PPE, including N95 and other respirators, surgical masks, and face shields. In addition, FDA has issued guidance documents providing regulatory flexibility to encourage the availability of gowns, medical gloves, respirators, and surgical masks during the COVID-19 public health emergency. FDA has also issued an EUA for face masks, non-surgical, for use by the general public and has an enforcement discretion policy to help facilitate additional availability of these products. If you are having challenges accessing face coverings or respirators, you may want to discuss what resources or PPE may, that may be available with your healthcare provider. We also have a website that has a lot of different resources available for the public. And I know that they have the resource page a little later on in the presentation. Again, very much appreciate the opportunity to listen to the stories and to participate in this event. Thank you so much, Dr. Ross, for sharing important information about accessing 
PE and the Emergency Use Authorization EUA. You mentioned a lot of information, um, including links. And so we're going to show on the next slide some of the resources that you mentioned in this ever evolving environment around accessing personal protective equipment. So these resources here, we're just going to hold on the screen for a minute or so. Um, take a look, take a screenshot, take your phone out, take a picture, and know that this recording will also be made available, and then you can just hit pause. So yeah, these links are a little bit long. We don't want you to spend too much time writing them all out, but we'll keep this slide up, or you can replay the recording. So now we'll hear from Rennie Moss our final community story about her son's access to clinical trials during the pandemic. Rennie, thank you so much for joining us. Can you tell us what happened? Yes, hi, thank you, Debbie, and thank you to everybody for joining us and listening to patient stories today. Um, I'm here to tell you how the pandemic has impacted our participation in a clinical trial. Our 15-year-old son, Philip, and our 12-year-old daughter, Helen, have neurofibromatosis type 1. It's an incurable genetic disorder that causes tumors to grow along the nerves in the body, as well as carries an increased risk of leukemia and other types of cancer over the course of their lifetime. Our son, Philip, is acutely affected by a large inoperable plexiform located in his neck. When Philip was 10, his tumor had grown to surround his carotid arteries and was threatening his airway. The growth of the tumor continued relentlessly. We watched and we waited for a promising clinical drug trial to come along that might save his life. That opportunity presented itself in the form of a drug trial at the NIH Pediatric Oncology Branch. He enrolled in September 2015 and began to take an oral MEK inhibitor targeted drug therapy. There are serious side effects that can be associated with this drug, and those are carefully monitored by his clinical trial medical team in Bethesda, Maryland. And for the past five years, we have traveled from our home in Birmingham, Alabama to Bethesda at a minimum twice per year. At each study visit, Philip completes safety monitoring exams that'll include EKG, echocardiogram to monitor his heart ejection fraction due to the known elevated CPK levels that can sometimes cause muscle deterioration, a thorough eye exam due to a rare but serious side effect that can cause a retinal blister. He also has blood work, pulmonary function tests, sometimes sleep studies, not his favorite, and DEXA scans, but most importantly is the MRI. Over the course of the last five years, Philip's tumor has shrunk just over 60%, resulting in significant clinical improvements and improved quality of life. We truly are the epitome of a grateful family for what clinical trials can mean to our family. In late April, 2020, the drug received the coveted FDA approval and now children across the country have access to the same life-changing drug therapy that our son continues to take. For the first time, there is an FDA-approved treatment for neurofibromatosis type 1. But when COVID-19 arrived to the United States, we monitored the situation closely knowing that Philip had his next study visit scheduled for the last week of April that would require us to fly to Bethesda. At each of these twice a year visits, following all the required tests, Philip has been approved to continue to receive six more months of the oral drug to continue treatment. But because of COVID-19, Philip was not able to complete the in-person tests in April. Instead, we had a telemedicine visit with his clinical trial team and completed pain and quality of life surveys by email and returned to the team. We were not able to complete the MRI that is now delayed until our next tentative trip upcoming this October. We were told to contact the study team if we suspected any new concerns and to seek local medical care immediately if necessary. This will be the longest Philip has gone between MRIs since his diagnosis. I shared that Philip is now 15 years of age. It's important to understand that with neurofibromatosis, Puberty is yet another new time of fear for us, as plexiform tumors can carry a risk of turning malignant. This is why the twice a year MRI is critical for his ongoing medical care. Thus, I would say the greatest impact that COVID has had on us is the gap in the life-saving medical surveillance by the exact same medical team that has imaged Philip's tumor and knows his tumor for over five years. Thankfully, Philip continues to receive the drug and we are grateful that that treatment continues but we are on high alert for changes in his vision, heart, muscle strength, any sign of new pain and other issues that can signal either a severe side effect from the drug therapy or a worse fear, leukemia or a tumor malignancy that carries with it a very low survival rate. I will also share that our daughter, Helen, who is 12, has developed small tumors on her scalp. She was due to enroll in the NF Natural History Study in April, but is now scheduled to coincide with her brother's October evaluation. 
should COVID cause a cancellation on our upcoming trip again, we will definitely work to complete any local imaging here in Birmingham, just in case there are acute concerns with our daughter that are right now are unknown. This clinical trial has given us our son's life back, not only life, but a significantly improved quality of life. And what this means to us is impossible to put into words. But COVID-19 has brought back fears that for a while, we've been able to push aside due to the excellent medical evaluation received from our clinical trial team at the NCI Pediatric Oncology Branch. Should COVID cause a cancellation in this upcoming trip, again, we will work with our local medical team to the very least complete an MRI to rule out malignancy and to hopefully show con con continued positive response to the drug therapy Philip takes. We are saving our COVID-19 stimulus check and cutting any expenses we can for any additional medical costs to ensure that our son's continued improved health as we can never return our back on this cruel genetic disorder and the way it affects our family. Thank you for hearing our story. Rennie, thank you so much for sharing your experience. Um, I'm sure that a lot of people watching were nodding their head and feeling very similarly, um, especially at the end. Um, it's really wonderful to hear how this clinical trial is such a game changer for Philip and literally saving his life and his quality of life. That's really great news and we couldn't be happier for your family, but um, you really drove the message that there's a lot unknown around COVID. How long will it continue to plague the world and what will it mean for your son's ability to access this trial if the pandemic interrupts uh, this trial in any way? And the future does seem uncertain, uh, unsettling. And while there's so much hope for research and trials for rare diseases, your family story really demonstrates that we have questions about the future. The rare disease community wants to know. And so we're really grateful that what you shared was heard by FDA and it reflects our greatest hopes these trials are working, um, but also some of our fears for the future. So I'd like to bring back Dr. Carol Zarad and Dr. Donahue for some feedback on Rennie's family story and about clinical trials during the pandemic. So as you can imagine, when it comes to clinical trials, we've received so many questions and the top question from the rare disease community for this listening session was this, how can ultra rare diseases still be researched and possible treatments discovered and studied in spite of COVID-19? And so I'm gonna throw that question to Dr. Elzerod. Uh, what is FDA's response to this? Well, uh, thank you um, again. And thank you, Rennie, for uh, um, telling us about the situation with Philip and Helen. And, um, hearing in your voice like the, the importance of the clinical trials and how how like integrated into every aspect of your life and it reminded us really why we do what we do across the board. So thank you so much for sharing that story with us. Um, obviously, we recognize that COVID-19 uh, is impacting the conduct of clinical trials across the board of medical products um, and that it, this impact may be felt acutely by patients with their disease for which there is often no available therapies. Um, FDA is working to advance treatment of rare disease and help ensure continuity of care for people with rare disease, uh, which, which altogether remain a top priority for us, even through, through this pandemic. Uh, working both with sponsors and patients, FDA remains focused on facilitating the development and approval of products for serious conditions where there is tremendous unmet medical need. Uh, to help sponsor conducting ongoing clinical trials during COVID-19 public health emergency, FDA published a guidance titled Conduct of Clinical Trials uh, of Medical Products During COVID-19 Public Health Emergency. The guidance was published all the way in March and since then it's been updated multiple times to respond to our community needs. Uh, it has recommendations about potential ways to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 on clinical trial conduct while also meeting the trial objectives and assuring patient safety and data quality and integrity, ultimately to make sure the trial is useful. Um, the guidance can also be found on FDA's website and is uh, often updated, as I mentioned, with new information based on questions that we receive from our stakeholders. I'm gonna discuss a little bit more details about this guidance in, 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 the, in the coming up question, but thank you again so much for this opportunity to mention. Thanks for that response, Dr. Carol Zarad. Uh, our next question is for Dr. Donahue. Um, and this is a good follow-up. What are some of the new practices or accommodations being put into place to allow patients with rare disorders to participate in clinical trials during this pandemic? Sure. So, uh, you know, we, we encourage appropriate approaches and tools that could enhance facilitation um, or enhance and facilitate participation in, in clinical trials. So, 
For example, when, um, when it's appropriate, decentralized design elements can help reduce um, the burden on trial participants, the travel burden, while also expanding the geographic reach of recruitment. Um, you know, I know for a lot of my trials, we have patients sometimes who relocate to a different country in order to participate in a clinical trial. It's a massive burden, and so decentralized trials have a lot of potential to address that. Um, and then the use of digital tools can allow for remote data capture in some circumstances. So we're hoping that um, adaptations like that could make a difference for patients like Helen and Philip and, and all the ones on this call. Thanks for that. Uh, at this time, no one in the United States is allowed to go anywhere. So <laughs> it seems like having decentralized trials, is, that's a real silver lining to the setbacks of clinical trials during this time, and that there are some real opportunities to make trials more accessible. So I guess the follow-up to that would be um, this question, how flexible will they be with remote capture in clinical trials? And will they value data as much in person versus uh, remote capture? And that question goes to Dr. Carol Zarad. Thank you again. And the, the, we all now aware that COVID-19 can impact ongoing trials because of challenges such as site closure, travel limitation, quarantines, and interruption to supplying the investigational product. A lot of this was illustrated in the story we just heard. FDA is already working with sponsors, hospital, academic centers, and investigators to, un to understand and address challenges that may disrupt trials, with patient safety, of course, being paramount. Um, as I mentioned before, the guidance that was published in March, the conduct of clinical trial for, med for medical products during COVID-19 uh, public health emergency, provided recommendations that touches on this issue. For example, capturing data from trial participants remotely, uh, which, which may include, of course, use of virtual uh, trial visits or electronic diaries, and uh, factors to consider when using remote data capture, that this is quite a bit of that. And also the guidance discusses potentially conducting certain laboratory and imaging assessments at local facilities when trial participants cannot access clinical trial sites as we, we again we heard in the story. Um, and this is of course uh, when public health measures uh, to control COVID-19 limit travel as we're all experiencing right now. Uh, we encourage also sponsors considering uh, the incorporation uh, of remote performance outcome assessment uh, or review-based clinician reported outcome assessments into clinical trial to uh, discuss with the relevant review divisions at the agency whether such remote assessments are appropriate uh, for the type of the data they plan to collect. And we think this is really an important, important step to understand what, what areas lend themselves to this type of data capture. We want to understand whether it is safe, for example, and feasible for the participants in the assessment at the subject location itself. Um, and we also, in the guidance we have, uh, we provided a mailbox to get questions and we use a lot of those questions to really advance how we develop this guidance and modify it. Uh, the, 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 the mailbox for that is clinical trials, uh, clinical trial conduct dash COVID-19 at fda.hhs.gov. And again, I encourage the community to look at this guidance. It has it outlined multiple ways that we hope they can make clinical trial more efficient and more feasible for the community at large. Thank you again for the question. Thanks so much for that. This guidance sounds like a game changer. And uh, thank you for that email address, which is on the screen, as you can see here. Um, so our next question goes to Dr. Donahue. What is FDA's plan on dealing with data interruptions for ongoing clinical trials, say, if assessments couldn't be collected? Yeah, so we, we recognize the challenges for rare disease um, clinical trials and, frankly, for clinical trials in general, given the impact um, of the pandemic on trial conduct. And we are committed to working with the community to find ways to, to make sure that these important trials can continue. Um, you know, we have a lot of experience working with pharmaceutical companies on trials in rare diseases that use, you know, surrogate endpoints or small patient populations. Um, you know, study recruitment challenges are nothing new for those of us working in rare diseases. Um, and so we will continue to work with sponsors that may have experienced additional difficulty in recruiting due to COVID-19. Um, so, you know, the impact of measures instituted to control COVID-19 can affect clinical trials in a lot of ways, including the design, what regions the study can be conducted in. Um, in, in the guidance that we've been talking about, we outline general considerations to assist sponsors in assuring the safety of trial participants in maintaining compliance with good clinical practice and uh, also in minimizing risk to trial integrity. Um, and so the bottom line is that the safety of patients uh, participating in trials during this pandemic is really our top priority. Um, and so modifications that need to be made to address that 
we, we have to accommodate them. Um, and we, we really encourage stakeholders uh, to talk with us in a timely fashion. So we are asking sponsors and pharmaceutical companies, don't just change your protocol, come talk to us about it so we can work together and make sure that the changes are going to keep patients safe and really, and, you know, preserve the trial integrity so that patients and doctors get the answers we need from, from these trials. Thank you so much, Dr. Donahue. So we've heard from our patient stories and we've heard from FDA responding to these three areas of drug shortages, personal protective equipment shortages, and clinical trials impact. We know that you have so many questions for FDA and due to time constraints, this is only 60 minutes, we could spend a whole day talking about the pandemic impact and how FDA is responding. Um, we knew we couldn't answer every question during this webinar. So FDA does have a place online where you can go to submit your questions. It's a special portal, Patients Ask FDA. And you can visit the link on the screen. I'll just say it out loud, fda.gov forward slash Patients Ask FDA. That portal is an area that you can ask a question. It doesn't have to be related to COVID-19, but it can be. That's what we're all here for, to learn about FDA's response to support us and the patient experience. But it can be about your rare disease, your health condition, drugs, devices, vaccines, blood, biologics. Um, this form is for patients, caregivers, advocates, healthcare providers, but it's not for industry stakeholders. Um, this form is also not a place to report adverse events, and that just means things like harmful side effects um, from your medical products or drugs. You should visit MedWatch reporting form, which is linked on this page, on, not on this slide, but if you visit fda.gov forward slash patients ask FDA, there's a link there to um, report adverse events. So that's a way to contact FDA. Now, maybe you wanna contact Nord. Maybe there's some way that Nord can help you. And Nord absolutely has resources to support you. We're here for you. We heard, we surveyed the community. 1,600 people told us uh, their concerns and their 95%, like Dr. Maynard mentioned, 95% were impacted by the coronavirus. We offer financial assistance for co-pays and travel to medical appointments. We have a series of educational webinars bringing experts in to help you navigate specifically the pandemic, including more recently a webinar we did on what will the future look like in a post-pandemic world for access to treatment and research. We have recordings available online. This recording will be available online by visiting rarediseases.org forward slash COVID-19. And I wouldn't be a good director of membership if I didn't mention that Nord works with an umbrella of 30 million Americans, but we also work to support the work of disease-specific nonprofit organizations, 330 of our member organizations. So if you have, uh, if you know what your rare disease is, at you, there may be a nonprofit that is supporting you and you can find them on our website. We offer ways to get con connected locally through our Rare Action Network, as well as advocacy opportunities to learn about your state and local issues for staying safe during the pandemic. So we only have six minutes left, and I'm just going to conclude this listening session um, by mentioning my quick story, just very quick. Um, my sister is struggling with a rare disease, pulmonary hypertension, and many of our family and friends are unaware of the work that the FDA is doing across various researchers and stakeholders. And personally, I didn't know until I started working in the community 22 years ago what the FDA did, uh, what they do now. And it is a relief to hear directly from FDA that their staff is working day and night proactively on helping to facilitate important clinical trials. My family story and the stories that you hear today, they're one of 30 million Americans living with rare diseases. For many, this may be your first time hearing about how the impact of coronavirus on other families. Um, this may be your first time hearing about the work of FDA. Um, it may seem that they're doing work behind the scenes. Um, building bridges uh, across these challenges during the pandemic, moving very quickly. But I can't say behind the scenes because everything FDA is doing is broadcasted online and their teams are proactively meeting with patient communities through these listening sessions. For example, uh, 70 FDA staff are tuned into this listening session and many more will access the recording later. So these family stories, you being here 
so important and unforgettable, capturing what is at stake here, that rare patients find themselves in a life and death struggle around the coronavirus if the coronavirus stops our community from accessing therapies, personal protective equipment, um, and accessing uh, clinical trials. If a clinical trial is keeping you alive and, and something happens to this, this trial because you can't travel there uh, to the site, and the future is unsure. And from what we've heard here today, the FDA, uh, their work is stronger and their commitment is strong that they are facilitating development and approval of products for serious conditions where there is tremendous unmet medical need. So that said, um, you know, this is a very scary time and we're so grateful to have FDA in our corner. I'd like to take a moment to thank all of our speakers from the brave accounts by our community speakers, Christy, we met and Laura Bonnell and Rennie Moss. And um, we know the pandemic has presented significant challenges for their families and them sharing their stories really demonstrate the hard work that they have had to overcome uh, and also hearing their concerns for the future. Very important. Thank you so much for for what you've shared. Nord would also like to thank everyone, all the patients who submitted stories in advance, um, all the patients and caregivers who asked very poignant uh, questions to FDA. And for everyone who is here and listening, thank you so much as we really address this unprecedented time. And on behalf of Nord, I would like to thank our FDA speakers, Drs. Donahue, Dr. Hare Alzarad, and Dr. Ross, and Dr. Maynard for their time and thoughtful response to our questions. And thank you to all the FDA staff who took time to thoroughly review the dozens of questions submitted by the community and to ascertain the most prevalent and significant topics on which to focus. So I'd also like to thank the Centers for Drug and Evaluation Research, the Centers for Drug and Biologic Research, the Patient Affairs staff, CDRH, and everyone at FDA who continue to create opportunities to listen to and to support the rare disease community in our struggles during this pandemic. Nord stands ready to remain a constructive partner to the FDA now and long after the pandemic. We encourage anyone who needs support and anyone who wants to join us in this fight to visit us online at rarediseases.org. Thank you so much for joining us and have a good day. Bye-bye.